are back with another episode of It's Not That Simple from the Francisco Manuel dos Santos Foundation. It's a pleasure to have you on board for what promises to be another fascinating conversation. Today's topic, happiness, something we all strive for, right? And what we're going to explore today is whether happiness can actually be studied as a science and there can be steps that we can all take and explore in order to reach that happiness. We're going to be doing it with Dr. Lori Santos. Uh, she's a professor, scientist, podcaster as well. She has a psychology and the good life course at Yale University where she is a psychology uh, uh, teacher. Um, she's also uh, got an online course which is called The Science of Wellbeing and her podcast, The Happiness Lab, is a top three Apple podcast already has attracted over 100 million downloads. Um, Dr. Lori Santos, it's such a pleasure to have you uh, with us here. And normally I know you do a lot of interviews in the States and they say Santos, but I can't help but call you Santos <laughs> since this is a Portuguese show. Um, first question has to be, what is your definition of, of happiness? Yeah, I mean, it's, happiness, we could take up the whole time talking today, giving a definition of happiness, but I tend to use the social scientist definition, which is the idea that being happy means feeling good in your life and with your life. So feeling good in your life is the fact that you have a decent ratio between positive and negative emotions. You have lots of joy and laughter and not so much things like anger, depression, sadness, and so on. Um, it doesn't mean you have no negative emotions, which you might talk about in a second, but mm. it means the ratio between the good emotions and the bad emotions is pretty good. That's kind of being happy in your life. But there's also the need to be happy with your life. You need to think that your life is going well. And that's the answer to the question, all things considered, you know, how do you feel like your life is going? And I love this definition in part because it shows that those two things, you know, they're different, right? They can go in different directions. We all know people, for example, who in their life have lots of hedonic pleasures, you know, lots of good things in life, but they might feel like their life is empty, like they don't have meaning. Um, you can also have a case where you're, you know, you're doing something meaningful, but in the trenches, you know, it can feel a little stressful. And so I think the best case scenario for our, our overall happiness and life satisfaction is that we're maximizing both of those things at once, if possible. I think you, you've set the stage really nicely for our, for our conversation. And um, here on this show, we try to break down uh, uh, topics that are important uh, um, on a human level. And of course, this is of the utmost importance. Um, why is it not that simple, uh, according to your experience and, and expertise, to reach happiness and then to maintain it as well? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of us are working towards happiness, right? You know, this isn't a new topic. You know, we've been focused on pursuing happiness, I think, for as long as we've been human. I think the problem is that we often go about it the wrong way. We have these theories about the kinds of things that make us happy. We have intuitions. Maybe I need to get a promotion at work, or I need to make more money, or I need the latest accolade, or I need to buy something new. We have a sense of the kinds of things that will make us happy. But when you go out and do the research with people who are actually happy, you can ask scientifically, you know, are the things that we think will make us happy, do those things really work? Do they work in the way that we expect? And a lot of times what the research is showing that the answer seems to be no. We have these intuitions that we might go after these things and it'll make us feel better. But when we actually get those things, it doesn't make us feel as good as we think. And we often are pursuing those things that might not make us happy at an opportunity cost of the stuff that really will. And so I think the process of pursuing happiness requires like a scientific insight, right? We need to ask like, do these intuitions we have, are they really going to work for the kinds of things that will make us feel better? You're a, you're a professor at, at Yale University, and I wanted to talk about your, your course and the success that is, it has had as well among, among students, which has been uh, outstanding. Um, tell us about what you teach, how you teach it, and when you first realized as well that, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm onto something really, really big here, and, and these kids are swamping my, uh, my classes. Yeah, I mean, it started when I took on this new role on Yale's campus. I became one of their heads of college. Um, and in that role, it means I was a faculty member. I live on campus with students. I eat with them in the dining hall. I kind of see them you know, in their day-to-day -day life. And honestly, I was pretty shocked by what I was seeing. I was seeing this college student mental health crisis up close and personal, where at least in the United States right now, over 40% of college students report being too depressed to function most days. Over 60% say they're overwhelmingly anxious, and more than one in 10 has seriously considered suicide. Um, you know, these are US statistics, and the statistics are almost as bad if we look in Europe and even worldwide. Like, you know, our young people are much less happy than they used to be. Mm. And so when I saw these statistics, I said, you know, as, a, as, a, as an educator, we need to do something about it. So I developed this class where I put together all these strategies 
that the science shows we can use to really feel better. Um, when I first taught the class, I thought, you know, it's a new class on campus, maybe 40 or so students will show up. Um, I was pretty shocked when a quarter of the entire Yale campus <laughs> uh, tried to enroll in the class yeah. and created all these logistical problems, you know, where we're going to put everybody and so on. But I mean, I think what it showed us is that students are voting with their feet. They don't like this culture of feeling so stressed out and depressed all the time. And they wanted some, some solutions. And, and the key, I think, is that the solutions they wanted were scientific solutions. They didn't want platitudes. They didn't want a bunch of kind of grandmotherly advice. They wanted to say, okay, what does the research show I can really do to feel better? And I think this is one of the reasons the class has gone, you know, beyond just a mere classroom on some Ivy League campus in the U.S. I think all of us are really looking for the kinds of things we can do to feel better. And taking the scientific approach can be so effective. Uh, it, it's interesting because happiness means different things to different people and different age groups as well. And as you said, you interact with, with, with students, with a lot of, of young people. How do they define what is happiness to them uh, compared to, to, to us? Uh, and when I say us, it's more adults or professional adults. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the misconceptions that college students have in a lot of ways mirror the kinds of things that adults are doing. I think one of the surprising findings that, that comes out of the work is that many of us share a lot of the same misconceptions. And the biggest misconception is that our circumstances matter for our happiness. For my college students, they think, oh, I need to get the perfect grades or I need to get into you know, the best medical school or graduate school or something like that. I think for professionals, you know, in the workplace, it's similar, I need to make more money, you know, I need to get to the next thing. We, we often think that it's our circumstances that matter. But if you look at the research, what it often shows is that you can have perfect circumstances and be you know, surprisingly sad, surprisingly upset, surprisingly stressed out. And even people in not so great circumstances can be happier than you think. And so I think even though the college students have a kind of different window on the kinds of misconceptions, like they kind of mirror the types of things we see in adult. We have these intuitions that are leading us astray. We're working on our happiness, we're putting work in, but we're doing it the wrong way. It's, it's uh, uh, fascinating to see how much life has changed for young people, certainly in my generation, when it comes down to the digital world, right? And, and the way in which people interact and communicate. Then we had COVID, obviously, as well. So a lot of young people were, were stuck at home. Do you think that the, 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 the topic of happiness and dealing with some of the numbers which you gave, which are quite shocking as far as depression and anxiety are concerned, uh, uh, has something to do with the fact that uh, uh, young people are less connected physically and, and, and have more, uh, uh, how shall I put it, superficial and distant digital relationships? Yeah, well, we definitely know that young people are less connected than they ever have been. I mean, there's a real crisis in loneliness that we see among our young people, but even in adults today, and, and you can see it in all these funny findings, right? You know, people self-report having less friends than they did 10 years ago, mm -hmm. less good mm -hmm. friends. Um, many people say if they needed to talk to a single person, they couldn't, you know, figure out a single person to call if they were having trouble. Wow. Um, people meet physically less in real life than they used to five to 10 years ago. And again, this wasn't COVID. These are patterns that were ongoing. Going that I think COVID really exacerbated. And it's, you know, it's really tempting to ask the question of like, okay, what, what happened? What transition happened in our collective culture? Again, this is in the US and in Europe, these statistics. And the, you know, the easy finger pointing is that technology, right? We have these devices, these screens that give us so much entertainment, a way to kind of feel connected, even though we're not actually meeting people or seeing others in real life. You know, is this what the cause is? And honestly, it's been hard scientifically to nail that down because we've all been in the same experiment. It's hard to find a good control group that just didn't get a smartphone, you know, around 2007 that didn't kind of see these changes. But what we do know is that correlationally, the more time that you spend on technology, and this is especially true for social media, but it's true of screens in general, the more time you're spending on that, the more you self-report things like depression and anxiety, um, often the lonelier you feel. And I think this is a little frustrating, right? Because we could be using our technologies to connect really well, right? I can use my phone to pick it up and, you know, call my mom in a different city. I could connect with a college friend that I haven't talked to, right? I think these, these in some ways, technologies were lifelines. But the problem is that we often use these things in ways that feel social, but aren't giving us the real benefit. We'll scroll through an Instagram feed or watch a bunch of TikTok videos. 
and the, 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 I like to say that this is sort of like the NutraSweet of social connection. It's like the Diet Coke of social connection. It kind of feels mm -hmm. like it's sweet or like it's social, but it's not giving us the same psychological benefit as we would get from in real life social connection. It's interesting to hear you say that because I remember I studied in the States for, for four years and it was incredibly expensive to call back home. And I would go months without you know, uh, uh, seeing or, or, or seeing because I would talk to, to, to my mother and my sister on the phone. Whereas nowadays, you know, it's so easy just to FaceTime someone or, or set up a, a Zoom call or a WhatsApp video call or whatever it is. So you would think that you could be more connected, but then it is maybe doing more of that and then less of the meaningful interactions. And I was just having a conversation and I wanted to get your take on this. I was having a conversation with, with my best friend the other day where we were discussing how difficult it is to go past the uh, uh, superficial interactions that you have with someone. Because for example, we can have, I don't know, 20, 30 WhatsApp conversations with people, right? A day, so we're connected. I don't, I don't know about how many topics, but then no one's really asking you how you feel. So, and, and there's no time to people, for people to say how they feel. So what have you noticed in that aspect from a, a scientific perspective or a, or a, or a, 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 a professional perspective? Yeah, I mean, there's some lovely empirical work on this very topic. Uh, a lot of it comes out of the lab of Nick Epley, who's a professor at the University of Chicago. And he does a lot of work on what he calls under sociality, right? We kind of mistakenly predict that we don't need as much or as deep of a form of social connection as we actually need to feel happy. And he specifically looked at what he calls deep conversations, right? You meet you know, someone at a coffee shop or at a restaurant for the mm. first time or someone new at work. And you kind of get to know them, but you talk at a very shallow level, right? You know, we talk about the weather, or, you know, these kind of short WhatsApp conversations that you're talking about. We kind of keep it at the very surface level. And we think that that feels better. Maybe it feels less awkward. But what Nick has found in his work is that if you go deeper, if you really ask someone, hey, how is it going? You know, what's working well? You know, what are some mistakes you've made that you want to correct? What are things you're grateful for? When you get deeper emotionally with people, we predict that that's going to feel awkward and weird, but in practice, it feels really good. In practice, that's the form of connection that we really need. So it's not just so much that we're not even spending enough time with other people or not connecting enough. We often don't go deep enough. We keep things so shallow that we're not getting the true benefit we could be getting from like actually connecting with other people. Well, we, you mentioned mental health and, and we live in a, in a generation that's certainly different when I was growing up 20 years ago where going to a, a, a psychologist or talking to a therapist was not as accepted as it is as it is nowadays um from from your experience what's the what's the main issue that especially young people have in, in being able to uh, uh, accept themselves and being able to to talk through what makes them feel better in order to reach happiness and how much of that has to do with expectations whether that's family expectations professional expectations friend ex expectations yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, the right now, I think we live in a very expectation high culture, right? I mean, I think there's a lot of talk about things like hustle culture, um, you know, the meritocracy that anyone can go to my amazing university at Yale, right, means that there's a lot of pressure on students to push themselves. <clears throat> and I think this isn't just young people, right? I mean, I think at work, you know, we deal with a lot of kind of type A personalities, people that are pushing, pushing, pushing. We have lots of expectations at work, but we put a lot of expectations on ourselves. And this is a thought pattern that researchers like uh, Professor Kristen Neff at UT Austin talk about in terms of kind of being your own like drill sergeant. We think we're in the military and we need to kind of scream at ourselves to perform better all the time. But what she's found is that this is yet another misconception. We'd be better off if we interacted in terms of our own thought patterns with what she calls self-compassion, um, which sounds a little cheesy, but really what she's talking about is that we treat ourselves like we would treat a good friend, right? You know, we'd have high expectations, but not unrealistic expectations. And the evidence suggests that if you can kind of talk to yourself in a self-compassionate way, again, sort of using this guise that like you're talking to your friend and you want to push your friend, but you do that in a curious way, not in a mean way. You do that in a way that's kind of encouraging rather than degrading. Um, there's evidence that you'll not only perform better, you'll procrastinate less, but you'll also feel better. 
And so I think part of the big problem is, is, not, is partly the expectations we have, but it's partly the way we talk to ourselves about those expectations. The research really suggests that you can have high expectations for yourself as long as you're making sure that you're engaging with talking to yourself in ways that can kind of promote good performance rather than make you so kind of feel, feel so bad and feel so afraid that you just procrastinate and avoid the tasks you need to do. That, that's so interesting because um, I, I think many times, many of us even consider the thoughts and feelings of other people more than we consider our own thoughts and feelings about ourselves, right? Uh, totally. I often joke that, you know, if, if, if HR, like an HR com in companies could hear the things we said to ourselves, we'd all be on watch like a lot more often. You know, we talk to ourselves in ways we never talk to our coworkers, that we never talk to our yeah. good friends. Um, and I think we do it because we assume it's effective, but the evidence suggests it's just not. How much does the pursuit of happiness generate anxiety trying to get there? So, and, and when do you know, okay, I'm here now, what do I do with it? Or, or, or is this it? Or is there something else? So I'm sure these are questions that, that you get, whether that's from, from your students or from your peers or from your colleagues. How, how, how do you try to break this down and, and, and explain it? Yeah, totally. I mean, these are questions I get even when people learn that I teach an Ivy League class on happiness. They, they'll say things like, oh my gosh, isn't that going to put even more pressure on people, you know, to feel happier? And I think this comes from a misconception. Again, I think we sometimes assume that a good life, a kind of happy life, a flourishing life would mean being happy all the time. It would be, it would mean avoiding all negative emotions. And I think this is yet another misconception. There's lots of evidence that negative emotions are important. They're signals that we use to figure out how to behave, how to make decisions, and how to act in the future. They don't feel great, but you know, a lot of the signals that we have in our body don't feel great. If you put your hand on a hot stove, that won't feel good. That will make you change your behavior. You'll move your hand. And there's evidence that things like sadness, um, anger, uh, a feeling of frustration, definitely a feeling of overwhelm, things like burnout, those are important signals that you need to pay attention to, that something's amiss, and that you need to develop a different balance. And so I think part of the reason that, you know, a lot of the work on happiness, when we think about happiness, we feel like, oh, it's going to just make me anxious. It's because we think we're trying to get to some standard that's not only impossible, kind of feeling happy all the time, no negative emotions, that, that sense is impossible, but it will, would also be a bad thing. If we could achieve just feeling happy all the time, that would be bad because sometimes negative emotions are normative. Sometimes they're effective and we need to pay attention to them. I, I wanted to as we talk about this, I wanted to, to get your take on whether you think happiness is more of a, 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 a psychological or, or a philosophical issue and, and, and problem. I think you need a little bit of both, right? I mean, I think we need we needed good philosophers to tell us, you know, what are the kinds of ways we want to live a good life? And these are philosophers going back, you know, way, way back in the day. You know, Aristotle was talking about eudaimonia, his idea of the flourishing life, you know, thousands of years ago. Um, but I think what we need for, from the science perspective is we need to figure out, okay, if that's the goal, philosophically speaking, how do we put it into practice? And I think this is a spot where the science has been so helpful because if we just consult our lay intuition, we often get the wrong answer about the kinds of things we need to do. But when we study happy people, when we say, okay, these folks are happy, what are they actually doing? Oh, they're not, you know, killing themselves at work. They're not kind of pushing it for these different circumstances, trying to get more money. They're connecting with other people. They're changing their thought patterns to feel a little bit more grateful. They're making sure that they have some free time. Like we can kind of figure out the right things to do. And so I think we definitely needed the philosophers. Um, you know, a lot of my podcast is sort of going back to some of the ancient traditions, the ancient wisdom. I think we also need the science to tell us how to get there. I know you've studied, uh, obviously, human psychology, but also animal psychology. Um, and w w when you think about animals being, being happy, is, is that a right term to use? Is it more about well-being? What can we learn from, from them? And, and I guess, what should we ignore from what we know about, about their emotions? Yeah, the puzzle with, with studying animals, which I think is such an important topic, is that we're pretty good at, at getting some great measures of their behavior. It's very hard to tell their internal state, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's hard to know what it's like to be a dog or to mm -hmm. be a bat be a chimpanzee. Um, we just use their behavior. And I think when we look at their behavior, what we often find is that 
you know, based on what we can, our best guess of how they're feeling, you know, their facial expressions, for example, or the fact that they're kind of engaged socially and they're kind of doing things that we might think of as fun or that promote well-being, you know, they kind of tap into some of the same things that we do. And I think in some domains, they do it better than we do. Um, I, I used to work with uh, monkeys back in my original day job was kind of studying monkeys and how they think. Mm. And I remember, you know, being at my field site where I'd plop down and just watch a monkey, you know, sitting there and looking out at the ocean or, you know, engaging, they'd be eating something and they'd look like they're fully present. And I find this quite ironic because in, in work on kind of mindfulness and meditation, there's often this talk of the monkey mind. And there's this idea that humans have this monkey mind where our mind is always moving around and we're thinking about a million things. And it's funny because I look at the monkeys and I say, they don't have a monkey mind. They're much more present than we are. We need to get back to monkey mind, you know, if we want to be happier. And so I, I do think that it, while it's hard to kind of really truly know what an animal is subjectively experiencing, we just don't have great measures for that. I think they can actually give us some, some hints about going back to the basics, the kinds of things we're evolved to do, be social, be present. And that can be really powerful in terms of ways that we can kind of mimic to improve our happiness. I think living the moment is something that most, I'm not going to say most, but many of us can struggle with because we can be trying to multitask. Uh, we are replying to an email, getting a WhatsApp notification, uh, thinking about what we need to do for dinner that evening and worrying about our greater purpose in life. So it is sometimes difficult to live in that moment, right? What do you tell people that, 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 that express frustration to you about not being able to do that and, and overthinking? Uh, uh, everything and, and going around in circles and not living that moment, like you were saying that yeah. the monkeys or chimpanzees can can do better than we do. Yeah, well, I think one of the things the one of the gifts the monkeys have is that they're not you know as affected by the technologies. Right? Oh. They don't have these notifications <laughs> no. kind of coming in, you know, in their daily monkey life. And I think that's one of the techniques that I talk with my students a lot about is that you know how can you engage with the things that are stealing your attention to try to get your time back? Because again, these you know, these technologies, these kind of demands on our attention aren't going away. Um, and one of the pieces of advice I really love and share with my students a lot comes from the journalist Catherine Price, um, who has this book, How to Break Up with Your Phone, where she argues you don't necessarily need to break up with your phone, but you need to take it to a sort of couples counseling, as it were. And so the, the acronym she uses for mindfully engaging with your phone goes by WWW, which in English stands for what for, why now, and what else. And she says, the next time you pick up your phone, ask this question of like, you know, what are you picking up your phone for? Mm. Like, was mm. it a purpose or did it just kind of wind up grabbing your attention for no reason? Um, why now? Can you kind of mindfully notice and pay attention to the triggers, the emotional triggers that are making you kind of disengage with the present moment and maybe pick up your phone? And then finally, most importantly, what else? What's the opportunity cost? What are you missing out on? Because you're not like paying attention. Like, what are you missing out on because you picked up your phone? And she has evidence that this kind of this practice of just again not getting rid of technology, not you know getting very anxious and worrying about being in the present moment, but just a strategy you can use for the very typical thing that steals our attention. Can you pay attention enough to say, ah, maybe this was a good decision to pick up my phone right now, or no, maybe I need to look at the springtime trees or kind of pay attention to what's going on in socially in real life. It's been a power, it's a powerful technique that my students really like to kind of not get rid of technology, but to pay attention a little bit more mindfully to how we're using it and how it's stealing our attention from the present moment. You, you were talking about that and I was, I was thinking about how any photograph these days of a concert or even a big uh, uh, sports event. And, and uh, I, I remember um, I, I follow the NBA very, very closely and, when LeBron James bo broke the all-time record for scoring, you s there's a shot that a lot of people commented on um, where everybody's recording it on their phone. And there's just mm -hmm. one, one guy who isn't, and he, he's always been with LeBron his whole life, but he was experiencing the moment where everybody else was experiencing through their phones. And you see that when you go to, to concerts or, or live events or whatever. Um, and that's so, so uh, fascinating what you were saying. Uh, uh, regarding the, those rules, and I'd, I'd love to be able to apply that in my in my day to day life. I can tell you that. Um, I did want to talk to you about fun. Okay, before we wrap up, you've talked about fun intervention. Uh, tell us what that is and the importance of fun for us to 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 help ourselves get get to to happiness or at, at yeah. least uh, 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 um, have moments of it. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we we often think that we should be working and sleeping and that's it, right? But we forget about fun. We forget about, you know, just activities that kind of make us come alive. And I think a lot of us, when we think about leisure, because we've worked so hard, we're just so exhausted that when we get free time, we don't sometimes use it well. In fact, there's lots of evidence that when people get leisure, they want to go for activities that feel kind of passive, right? You plop down and watch TV or you scroll through social media. But the evidence suggests that when we do passive activities, it just doesn't feel as good as when we're doing something active, even though the active stuff may take a little bit more cognitive work, right? And you know, think about how the last time you felt when you, you know, you're on the screen scrolling through possible things you could watch on whatever platform you're on, that kind of made you feel gross or apathetic. It, it wasn't mm. the same if you were engaged in like a sport or played a game or were learning something new, learning to play an instrument, just learning anything new. And so the evidence suggests that we really need to engage in active leisure. And that's really what fun is. It's something that feels very active. You're very mindful and you're in, in, in a sense of flow, but it's also a leisure that's often much more social. That's another thing with passive leisure. It tends to be you know, us by ourselves scrolling through something as opposed to with other people. But the other key thing about fun is that it tends to be relatively playful, right? There's no, the reward is intrinsic. You're not doing it to put something on your resume. You're doing it just because it's fun. Um, and the evidence suggests that we're not getting as much of it as we could be, right? Especially our young people. I think they're so scheduled these days. They don't, they often don't even remember what fun is. But it turns out we do that at our peril because the evidence also suggests that getting in like positive leisure is what we really need to kind of become a little bit more resilient. It's what we need to actually perform better at work is a little bit more fun. So the fun to prevention is really thinking about, okay, when's the last time you had fun? You know, really, really think about what, what were you doing? Who were you with? It's okay, no judgment if it was like a couple years ago, if it's been a while since you had fun. But try to figure out what, what might you might call your fun factors, right? You know, if you tend to have more fun out in nature, maybe you need to get there more often. Or if the last time you really had fun was with music or moving your body, what can you do to build that in? And so I think we need to be more intentional about finding fun and using our leisure well. Otherwise, there's so many other you know, easy passive leisures that will just kind of sneak in. You need to get a little bit more intentional and really intervene to enjoy your leisure more. What I find a lot of times is that we, we try to get something out of every moment and we have expectations for when we do have free time to do something that's also going to be productive. Right. When, yes. when that then also creates some anxiety. So, OK, I had an hour to myself. I watched this because I felt like my friends were watching it. So I had to watch it. I've watched it now, but I've just wasted an hour, which I could have done something which was truly fun. And I think, again, that's something which uh, I know I struggle with and, and I know uh, friends, friends struggle with as well. And very, very, very important point um, to wrap up our, our conversation. We have some quick fire questions. Um, um, I've got four of them for you. So in one sentence, tops, I'd love you to, to answer these. Uh, first one is, what is the personality trait um, that one successful person or successful leader could really benefit from having, in your opinion? Um. Honestly, I think it's trying to be a little bit more extroverted. Um, there's lots of evidence coming out that we often think that whether you tend to be a kind of more introverted person is like a trait, like it's the kind of thing that's built in. But there's evidence that if you become a little bit more social and engage in deep conversations, you will feel more connected. And I think this is how we build close relationships in life, but definitely close relationships at work. I think we need deeper conversations at work to feel better. What is the biggest challenge that humanity is facing today within your area of expertise and, and, and your experience? I think we need to figure out how we overcome the loneliness crisis. I think we need to figure out how to live with our technology in a way that promotes in real life social connection, not just being on screens. If you could change one thing by magic right now, what would, what would that be? Oh, I would I would realign the fact that uh, things that we think are good for happiness don't necessarily work. I would make my brain want to seek out all this stuff that we know is good for happiness, more social connection, more active leisure, more mindful time, less scrolling. Um, I think if we could get our brains to seek out the stuff that was good for us, that would be a good kind of change to our neuroscience. OK, and finally, um, what is the most important learning of your life and, and career? If you could kind of sum it up. Yeah, I think it's that, that happiness is under our control. And if we know how to get there, we can actually feel a lot better. That's, that's pretty clear. Um, 
Dr. Lori Santos, it was a, an absolute pleasure uh, speaking with you. I, I, I certainly have learned a lot in, in our conversation and um, I'm sure our, our viewers and listeners have as well. Uh, continued success uh, with all your work. Congratulations for everything you're, you're uh, able to, to accomplish and, and, and the help that you are giving a lot of people out there and uh, um, hope to have an opportunity to speak with you again uh, uh, in the future. Thanks so much, obrigado. <laughs> muito bem, muito bem. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Laurie Santos, um, our guest uh, in this episode of It's Not That Simple, talking about happiness, defining it, um, breaking it down and uh, exploring all the factors around it that uh, allow us to uh, reach it or not and uh, um, all the steps that can be taken in order to uh, accomplish it. It was an absolute pleasure speaking with us. That's been another episode of It's Not That Simple from the Francisco Manuel dos Santos Foundation.